thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'm David Yepsen. I'm the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Uh, I see uh, President Randy Dunn is here, but on, uh, if, if, I, if President Dunn, would you like to say a few words? Please come up and... and, oh, and how about this? Welcome. <laughs> See, my script says that on behalf of President Randy Dunn, I'm to well, so I read it right here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, before we begin, uh, I do have some announcements, uh, as I always do, a few commercials here. On Monday, Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina reflects on the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. His lecture is at 7 p.m. in the Student Center Auditorium, which is here. Yeah, and, and is sponsored by the Institute and the Black Law Student Association. Secondly, on April 9th, Dr. Randy Balmer, chair of the religion department at Dartmouth College, and he's really one of the nation's leading scholars on religion and politics, uh, speaks on his recent book uh, about President Jimmy Carter and American evangelicalism. That's on Thursday, April 9th at 7 p.m. in the law school auditorium. And then on Monday, April 13th, we're really excited to uh, host David Axelrod, who was uh, President Obama's senior advisor. He delivers the Morton Kenny lecture on his new book, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. And that is at 7 p.m. in Shryock Auditorium. So please mark your calendars. I think there's flyers uh, outside on the table that you can uh, pick up on your way out as a reminder. You know, finally, we need your help. Uh, this Gene Hurley Simon Fellowship is a very important part of the Paul Simon Institute and Southern Illinois University. The series is dedicated to public policy issues in law, women in politics, education, and libraries. I know many people in this room tonight knew Gene well. Lawyer, legislator, librarian, author, wife, mother, grandmother, and a trailblazer in her own right. She was one of the first female prosecutors in Cook County and was elected to public office in the 1950s. She was elevated SIU and herself to prominence by President Clinton when he appointed her to be the chair of the National Commission on Library and Information Science. Doings so flow from this campus while also helping Paul start the Institute uh, and teaching in library science. Now here's how you can help. This lecture is supported by an endowment that we are hoping to substantially increase so we can bring more women of distinction to our campus to speak more frequently than current funding allows. So we ask for your help. There are many ways to give. The cash in the form of checks and online credit card donations are the simplest way. Our giving website can be found in the program. And if you'd like to talk for, about other gifts, Delio Calzolari, our associate director, waving his hand over there, uh, please see him. And speaking of distinguished women, I want to recognize her daughter, the former Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, and our friend Sheila Simon. Sheila. Our format tonight is familiar uh, to all of you. Our speaker will speak for 30 to 40 minutes. And these lights are a real incentive for speakers to move it along, okay? Because when you're done up here, you're sort of medium rare. <laughs> And then we'll save time for your questions, which I hope are sh kept short and to the point. And to introduce our speakers, my friend and colleague, University Professor Dr. Linda Baker. Linda. Good evening, David. Thank you very much. And to Dr. Dunn and all of you uh, recognizing uh, Sheila Simon, R really want to thank all of you for coming out. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce the speaker for this evening. Uh, the speaker is certainly one that is known throughout the state of Illinois and really throughout the country. Uh, Governor Rauner appointed Felicia F. Norwood as the director of the Department of Healthcare and Family Services in January of this year. Several of you asked whether or not Felicia had her confirmation. She had the distinction of being in the first wave of confirmations and so she comes to us today as a confirmation 
confirmed director of that department. Uh, Felicia brings to the Department of Healthcare and Family Services more than 20 years of experience in healthcare policy, business operation, and healthcare delivery. Felicia spent a large portion of her career working at Aetna Insurance Company, and most recently she served that, com that company as the president of the Mid-American Region, overseeing a budget of more than $6 billion. She began her career at Aetna as the Government Relations Council. She drafted legislation. She worked very closely with all the members of the healthcare industry. From 2006 to 2010, Norwood stepped away from Aetna and became the CEO CEO and President and COO of Active Healthcare Management. This is not the first time that Felicia Norwood has been in state government. This is her third tour of duty. Uh, Felicia spent time as the senior policy advisor for then Governor Jim Edgar, where she led the health care reform initiatives and she chaired the Governor's Human Services Subcabinet. She also served as the policy advisor on human services for then Governor Thompson, where she developed it and implemented policies on children and family services, public health, and mental health. Felicia Norwood earned her degree in law from Yale, her master's degree in public and, and political science from the University of Wisconsin, and her bachelor's degree in political science from Valdosta State University in Georgia. I'd like to introduce to some of you and to present to others my very good friend, who I often call my sister, uh, Felicia Norwood. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker, David, President Dunn, Sheila. It's really a pleasure to be here this evening. Earlier this week, the senior management team at the Department of Healthcare and Family Services gathered for a day-long strategy session. If you had been a fly on the wall, you would have heard a mind-bending string of acronyms. We talked about CCEs, ACEs, BIP, the ACA, FQHCs, those are federally qualified health centers, along with MLRs, MMIS, FPL, to say nothing of PIPs and CHIP, and so many more. And you would have heard a lot of figures in that meeting as well. We tossed around a lot of Bs, Bs as in billions of dollars. As we close that session, I asked all of our senior management to remember something that all of us can too easily forget as we try to do our jobs. Those acronyms and those figures all represent a real person or a real healthcare service delivered for a real person here in the state of Illinois. We have a terrifically committed and seasoned staff at the department, all doing the right thing. But speaking for myself, if I ever lose sight of the fact that public policy is about people and that all the figures and abbreviations mean something very important to millions of Illinoisans, that's the day for me to start looking for another job. One of the reasons that I took this opportunity to come here this evening, aside from the fact that it's very difficult for me to say no for Dr. Baker, <laughs> is to share my passion for public policy, particularly healthcare policy, and for the people of this state. Tonight I hope to offer you some thoughts on how you can blend the energizing excitement of public policy innovation with the realization that our responsibility is to help make people's lives better. David and Dr. Baker, President Dunn, this is an honor and a privilege to stand where 
a Supreme Court Justice, State Supreme Court Justice, the President of the Cook County Board, the President of the United States now. I toured the Wall of, frame, the wall of Fame in the Institute and to discuss with you one of the great challenges facing our nation and our state is an opportunity for which I am extremely grateful. I do have a couple of other reasons that I wanted to come here and visit this evening as well. Dr. Baker, as a former top deputy at HFS and a former head of the Department of Human Services, you have been in about the same position as I am now. And I'm sure you don't envy where I am. <laughs> Because of your background and experience, I am happy to have the opportunity to share ideas and strategies with you. And David, your predecessor as director, Mike Lawrence, has been my mentor and my friend. I will always cherish the late night strategy sessions in the governor's office more than 20 years ago when we would thrash out grand policy ideas and Mike in his quiet thoughtful and incisive way would tell us how our sublime ideas once made public would certainly blow up in everyone's faces. <laughs> Mike's wisdom, counsel, and passion were invaluable during my tenure in the Edgar administration and I just can't say enough about the impact that he had on me and my tenure in public service. But topping this all off, I feel privileged to give a talk named for one of the great leaders of our state. And I feel a real kinship with Gene Simon. For one thing, both of us earned our law degrees, and neither of us did much lawyering. <laughs> Instead, spending most of our careers trying to advance public policy. And like Gene Simon, I have a costly piece of paper on the wall <laughs> that occasionally convinces people that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and like her, I also believe that titles and the trappings of power do not and should not matter. In the collection of Jean Simon papers here at SIU is a talk that she gave when her husband was running for president. The topic was what would it mean to her, if he won, to be called First Lady. If any title is to be given, she said, I want to earn it. I could not have put it better myself. Leadership and public policy is not about a title. It is about earning the respect and confidence of the people that you serve. I know one of the purposes of these talks is to discuss how we can make our own way in public life to make a difference for real people. And those of you here who are students will find your own way. You will find opportunity when you least expect it. And if you're like Gene Simon, you will earn some immeasurably valuable experiences along the way as you help others. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got here. It's certainly not the path I ever thought I would take. But I think my life work so far can hopefully offer some lessons on taking opportunity and running with it. I grew up in South Georgia, a small town of about 4,500 people. And I went to undergraduate school a couple of hours from home at a small university called Valdosta State University. After graduation, I jumped at the opportunity to have financial support for graduate school through an offer of an advanced opportunity fellowship to the University of Wisconsin in, Mad in Madison to get my master's degree in political science. Several of my classmates in the master's program were obviously very interested in continuing in the PhD program. But while I enjoyed the academic rigor and intellectually challenging environment of Madison, my passion was not in continuing in a PhD program. So my childhood dream had been to be a lawyer. 
So I was really trying to figure out what I would do upon graduation, since I definitely didn't have the money to go to law school. I was having a conversation one evening with the professor in the graduate student lounge, and he told me about a fellowship in Illinois state government. Now, Illinois was certainly known for its politics, and not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> so I was somewhat curious, of course, but I explained to him that I actually knew no one in Illinois. But he described the fellowship to me and said it was something that I might want to consider. So I applied, and 30 years ago, the Dunn Fellowship Program launched my career in Illinois state government. The Dunn Fellowship was established in 1979 as the Governor's Year-Long Fellowship Program and was renamed the Dunn Fellowship Program in 1981 after James Dunn, who was a Rockford, Illinois citizen who did outstanding public service. The fellowship's purpose is to develop college graduates who have demonstrated a commitment to academic excellence and community involvement into capable leaders. Fellows are given an opportunity to develop skills in budgeting, legislation, and communications. So during my fellowship, I rotated through the governor's office of the Bureau of the Budget, the governor's legislative office, and a state agency at the time that was called the Department of Commerce and Community Affairs. At the end of that fellowship, I joined what was called the governor's program and policy staff and was assigned to the area of health and human services. Now the Dunn Fellowship Program continues today, along with others, targeting college graduates and students in master's programs to afford an opportunity to enter the realm of public service. I think it represents an excellent opportunity to learn about state government from varying perspectives. A spirit of bipartisanship, collegiality, and commitment to services permeated the fabric of the fellowship program at the time. There were nine fellows in my class, and about five months ago, seven of us got together to celebrate the anniversary of our fellowship program. One continues to work today in government for the North Carolina General Assembly. So there was really just a great spirit of bringing people together in the state to serve in government, and I think it's just an excellent way to learn. So that's how I came to government the first time around. I left the program and policy staff three years later. I had saved a little bit of money, and I decided to apply to law school. So I went to law school, but as you know, only practiced for a little over a year and a half. And at that point, I received a call from an individual that I had worked with in government the first time around in the governor's legislative office, Kirk Dillard, who later became a senator. And he asked me to consider a position in the Edgar administration as the senior policy advisor for health and human services. My first answer to him was absolutely not. <laughs> I'm finally making money. <laughs> I paid my student loans. So the timing couldn't have been worse in terms of leaving the firm. I loved the work, and I was really enjoying learning about banking and public finance, something totally different from what I had done before. But the opportunity to return to public service in the role that I was being asked to undertake at the age of 31 years old was the best opportunity to come along at the time and it was probably the best four years I ever spent doing anything. The challenges of that first year are reminiscent, albeit on a smaller scale, of the same challenges we face today. However, with discipline and strong leadership from Governor Edgar and the wise counsel and collaborative work with people like Joan Walters, who was the head of the budget office, and Mike Lawrence, who was in the governor's press office, and others, the governor was able to work with the General Assembly to begin to restore the state to sound financial footing. 
but it was a very, very painful first year. I remember the General Assembly that's generally scheduled to adjourn on May 30th at the time. We adjourned on July 19th. So I saw fireworks in a number of different ways in the state capitol. <laughs> So this represents my third tour of duty in public service. And I'm asked every single day, particularly over these last two months, what on earth were you thinking about? <laughs> Did you not understand the enormous challenges facing this state? And I thought I did, but you never do until you get there. <laughs> the answer though, in some respects, in terms of why I came back, is somewhat simple. One of my guiding principles in life has always been that to those to whom much is given, much is required. So that's the underlying reason. But equally important, is a passion that I have for healthcare policy and the ability to shape a healthcare system in this state that can provide access to quality, affordable care for Illinois' most vulnerable population. Governor Rauner made the following statement early on. We have to accomplish two overarching goals. We need Illinois to be competitive, but we need Illinois to stay compassionate. We can't do one without the other. He went on to say that we can judge our state by how well we take care of our most vulnerable citizens. The most vulnerable among us need our help. They deserve our help. I believed that I was in the unique position to leverage eight years of experience in state government and almost 19 years in private health insurance to help make a difference. So here I am. When I worked at Aetna, I thought, you know, this is a really big company, and it certainly is. It's a Fortune 100 business, and the Midwest region that I headed up had a budget of $6 billion in annual revenues. And then I came to healthcare and family services. Healthcare and family services has a number of functions. Chief amongst them is running the state's child support program. And that's really a big job in and of itself. But the major mission is overseeing Medicaid in Illinois. And Illinois Medicaid is quite simply the largest insurer in the state. The budget for healthcare and family services this year is $20 billion, with more than 3.3 million individuals receiving benefits. I should note that when I left state government in December of 1994, that number was 1.3 million. So like so much of everything else when it comes to politics, this is not what was quite expected at the start of this program in Medicaid. Medicaid, as you know, entered this world as a relatively small program. It was 50 years ago, this summer in fact. President Johnson signed the Medicaid Act into law in July of 1965. That first year of its existence, there were probably no Bs in terms of billions. It was a program measured in millions. It has since become one of the largest items in both the state and federal budgets. And I don't say that as a bad thing necessarily. We are talking about a 50-year-old program that has is immeasurably improved the lives of tens of millions of people. But as Medicaid approaches the birthday at which it will, it will be receiving in the mail its AARP card. <laughs> Sorry, that was for those of us who've been receiving AARP cards. It's right and necessary that we take stock of this program. We truly are at a point nationally, and certainly in state government, when we need to step back 
and think about the policies that drive this vital and giant service. When we come down to the basics, two questions Medicaid is always sought to answer are the following. First, to whom do we need to provide health care? And secondly, what exactly do they need help with? Originally, Medicaid provided funding for a few specified categories of low-income individuals, children, pregnant women, parents of dependent children, those with disabilities, and seniors. These are what we call our core populations of need. The program covered basic health care needs at the time, as it does today, physician visit, uh, visits, critical surgery and procedures, and hospital stays. But it never was that simple. There are always new needs, new technology, things that come along. And there is the desire to help those who need our assistance, and that is something that's very important. What we have today is a state and federal partnership. The federal government establishes the general guidelines and then states design, implement, and administer their own programs. In addition to setting guidelines, the federal government thankfully picks up half the tab, at least half the tab. Illinois receives a match rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50.8%. So states are required to cover individuals who are in certain categories or at certain income levels with a lot of federal oversight and federal money. The biggest change to Medicaid came, as you probably know, with the Accountable Care Act, the ACA. That's also one of our many acronyms. To most people, though, it's better known as Obamacare. Much of the attention on Obamacare has focused on its cost and its requirements that everyone be insured. But a major part of the Accountable Care Act has been to expand who will receive Medicaid. Fundamentally, the ACA said the program will now cover non-elderly adults. And it also put in place a uniform minimum income eligibility requirement. Basically, the ACA says that states need to cover all individuals whose incomes are at 138% or less of the federal poverty level. And again, it's never that simple. As you know, the Obamacare decision of the Supreme Court of 2012 basically said, when it was all said and done, that the federal government can, in fact, make every American get health insurance. Less reported, though, the Supreme Court struck down the requirements that states had to expand their Medicaid programs. As a result, it is up to each state to decide whether to do so. So that brings us back to Illinois. It is news to no one that our state is facing a big fiscal crisis, a huge hole that is one of the biggest that we've ever confronted. In other words, we have an added overriding policy question we now need to answer. How do we best continue to care for the most vulnerable and those in need when the money just isn't there? This is really the intersection of policy, politics, and spending. As I tell the staff at Healthcare and Family Services, I'm feeling a real sense of deja vu. When we look at the circumstances, the first year of the Egger administration, a lot of the issues that we are grappling with today are issues that we grappled with then and then more. In the last dozen years alone, spending on Medicaid in our state has nearly doubled. Illinois is one of the states that chose to move ahead with the ACA expansion. That has meant in just the last few years, more than half a million additional people are receiving benefits with the possibility of another 100,000 more expected. Again, numbers, but real people getting real help. 
but also real expenses to be faced. Right now, the federal government is paying 100% of the ACA additions, but that percentage goes down in the coming years. So this is the reality that the General Assembly and the new governor confronted as 2015 opened. A $6 billion hole in the state's budget and a growing number of people receiving care. It is an unfortunate fact that you cannot fill the budget hole if you don't look at Medicaid. A few days ago, I had the honor, privilege, of testifying to the Senate Appropriations Committee. It was, to say the least, an intense session. <laughs> there were standing room only, providers, advocates, lobbyists, the media, Everyone, I would like to believe, bringing with them the best interests of the state and those that in need. Everyone certainly did not agree on how to approach the problem. This heightened level of interest is really no surprise to anyone. Our proposed budget includes nearly $1.5 billion in reductions in the Medicaid program. Let's put it another way. The reductions in Medicaid spending alone are larger than the entire budgets of all but three other state agencies in Illinois. Again, not surprising. But this doesn't mean that Medicaid is being affected more than other areas or agencies. But I'll give you one more look at it. The state's total operating budget is somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 billion. Medicaid, as I pointed out, represents 20 billion, or one third of all state spending. So this budget then has become a lesson in policy making on a grand scale. As I said in the opening of my testimony to the Appropriations Committee, this is not the budget that anyone ideally would want. It is a spending plan that was formed and will continue to be formed under the pressure of an unprecedented fiscal crisis in Illinois that we certainly don't need to belabor, but we can't ignore. So let me share with you some of the policies that we use to guide our decisions in pulling together this budget. Again, we wanted to seek to care for the core populations at need, in need, during this time of crisis. So we established four principles. The first is that we wanted to keep as many people covered as we could, including the more than half million individuals who have recently joined Medicaid. Other states that are facing similar circumstances, but even less dire fiscal dangers, took coverage away from large numbers of people or never chose to expand coverage at all. We do not. And we especially focused on keeping children and those in need covered. Second, we wanted to use the new healthcare environment to find solutions. This budget is shaped by the new healthcare environment that has emerged in recent years. The insurance exchanges and some employer benefits have become a reality. We felt it would be fiscally irresponsible not to look for sound alternatives that now exist, and we succeeded in finding many. In addition, managed care and coordinated care are evolving models in Medicaid that we believe can provide quality care at sustainable costs. Third, we look to bipartisan solutions of the recent past. In 2012, the General Assembly actually passed a sweeping reform of Medicaid, attempting to deal with the same problems that we are grappling with now. It was called the SMART Act, Save Medicaid Access and Resources. Now, everyone didn't support the reforms, and we understand that. But after long and deliberate negotiations, the SMART Act passed with overwhelming support less than three years ago. Examining the core needs that Medicaid seeks to cover, the SMART Act made very difficult decisions. The General Assembly worked in a bipartisan manner 
and preserve the health care program that millions of us rely upon in this state. Much of this budget looks to the SMART Act as the model that we use this time around. The last thing that we used in terms of our principles, as I said to the Senate, is to help everyone understand that this budget is a framework. We see it as a catalyst for exchanging ideas and working to find answers. We are firmly committed to the overall framework and the spending numbers that have to be achieved to help overcome the state's fiscal crisis. But within those parameters, we have already begun discussions with literally hundreds of stakeholders. I have personally sat down with hospitals, safety net hospitals, rural providers, children's hospitals, managed care entities, clients who use our services, parents of clients who use our services, legislators, dental representatives, podiatry representatives. My office looks like the United Nations of healthcare providers. We want everyone to understand that we want to have a dialogue around priorities and solutions, and that is the spirit that we bring to this discussion. The bottom line is that the agency is very much committed to ensuring quality health care at sustainable costs, empowering people to make sound decisions about their well-being, and maintaining the highest standards of program integrity on behalf of the citizens of this state. These next few months will be some of the most critical ones for the Medicaid program and the people of Illinois who rely on their government to help meet basic needs. And as we decide on final answers for this budget and move forward, I look forward to helping transform healthcare and financial and healthcare services to serve people of this state even better than we to do today. Even after the budget hole is solved, one of the great challenges we are grappling with is our transition to managed care. As I mentioned, this is an issue that the state first began looking at in the early 90s when I was on Jim Edgar's staff, but now it's become a reality. In the past few years, more than half of all Medicaid clients have moved into managed care or coordinated care systems. This is a revolutionary change in how we work with providers and individuals. Within a short time, over two million Medicaid clients will be getting their care through some type of coordinated care, managed care entity, another acronym, acronym that we used, MCEs. The older model of service had the agency paying for each service individually, separately for each visit. A lot of things that we paid for are based on volume. As we seek to go forward, our focus has to be around prevention. How do we make sure that individuals get the care that they need on the front end, as opposed to showing up in costly emergency room settings? As you think about this, there's so many changes on the forefront. In the context of this change, we are talking about how do we reach Medicaid clients directly to encourage them, to educate them about this new decision, and to take advantage of the kind of care that we envision in a world where preventive care becomes the standard, where parents receive screenings and early intervention that will mean better lives on the front end and more sustainability with respect to health care costs. So I hope that you follow the debate about health care closely in the weeks to come. And I'm hopeful that my talk here tonight will spark greater interest for all of you in terms of these services that affect so many people so dearly in this state. And if I'm lucky, I will be working with some of you, students maybe, in one of the state's fellowship programs, or as an advocate like Gene Simon, or as a legislator. 
And that, if it happens, would be RCT, a really cool thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Norwood. I, I appreciate that. Um, what it will now open uh, this uh, the floor up to uh, to your questions. Um, short questions are appreciated, so we can cover uh, a lot of ground. Um, we've got uh, 18 minutes. Uh, we have. I appreciate it if we if you could use one of the. Uh, handheld microphones here so that we're sure everyone can hear the question uh, and and the answer I'll uh, while you're all thinking of your questions I'll uh, I'll start off the questioning with a fairly simple one how do you get 1.5 billion dollars without diminishing somebody's health care um, I think one of the a, a, a couple of things that we are we are doing, um, as you know, this state relies heavily on programs that allow us to maximize federal resources, and we've had many partners in the provider community that help us to do that hospitals, nursing homes, many others. But one of the things we know is that Illinois doesn't avail itself to all of the assessment opportunities that might be out there. So our challenge in this day, as I say every day, is to bring every federal dollar into Illinois that we can possibly garner because a federal dollar that doesn't come here goes to another state. And we have found receptivity in many corners in terms of helping us to, to do that. The other thing that we are going to do is to restart um, application for waiver programs with the federal government that also bring in dollars but allow us to have more flexibility in terms of the programs that we have in the state. One of the things that we, we think about is we pay for a lot of care. We don't pay for the care in the right place and in the right setting. So Illinois probably spends a lot of money on institutional care and hasn't done as good a job as other states in terms of building out a system of community services to support individuals in a variety of settings. So states have used waiver programs to leverage the ability to have more flexibility from the federal government, but equally as important to garner additional federal dollars that you can bring into the state to help support the development of an infrastructure of community services for our older populations, for individuals with serious mental illnesses. So we need to develop that infrastructure in the state. So I think one of the things we have to do is rationalize how we spend valuable state resources. Uh, we see a revolving door or as I said, in emergency rooms, hospital settings for care that really could be delivered in a less costly setting, and I would say probably much more effective in the community, which is why a movement towards managed care can really help us focus resources and get a mindset around prevention as we help to educate our clients on how you access health care in a system that far too long meant that parents showed up in emergency room when their kids get sick as opposed to developing relationships with the primary care provider, with the doctor, with the nurse practitioner, with others who can take care of problems before they get to the point of showing up in an ER. And who wants to spend four hours waiting in the hallway of an ER trying to get care. So there's some real opportunities for us going forward as we think about how we deliver health care in the state. But we certainly will need to garner every federal dollar that we possibly can to support this work because it's going to take that and more to be able to get the job done. Questions? Carol, do, uh, we can't see very well here, so oh, okay. quick question. Um, 
Miriam Wick Mollis in Jackson County Health Department. A follow up to actually what you were just saying. So what you were describing sounded sounds like the 1115 waiver that was being explored under the Quinn administration. So is that moving forward? And also related to that was all of the work that was being done to transform health care. And could you just share a little bit about what your ideas are on those two sure. issues? So we are. Um a couple of things happened. The, uh, the Quinn administration had been working on the 1115 waiver. We have to step back, take a look at the waiver. Really, the, the stakeholder input was fantastic. There were a lot of meetings that took place around the state to try to understand what the needs were. What we have to step back and do now is ask ourselves, I, I think, how do you prioritize what needs to get done? I think far too often we try to take on too much and end up not accomplishing what is absolutely important in order to have a healthcare system that we can use countless organizations that are already out there and leverage the work that's being done. Uh, far too often, you know, we were talking earlier, there needs to be the kind of linkages we're talking about with our local public health departments, being able to work in collaboration. I was talking to people earlier about collaborations that take place downstate. You probably have really put the, the real work here already is being done. But we are going to certainly jumpstart the waiver process again. Uh, several legislators are also very much interested in that. But I think that will give us the ability to have some flexibility in the way that we deliver services and be able to leverage the work that's already been done. We don't want to recreate the wheel around stakeholder meetings and all of that. That's something that's valuable. But we do want to prioritize what needs to happen first. So let's just say, for example, we know that we need to focus on children's mental health services in this state. Uh, we don't have a, a, a good community infrastructure for dealing with children's mental health issues. So as we think about the kinds of things we need in the waiver, we have to think about where the, the gaps and deficiencies already exist in the state's human services fabric and plug those gaps before we layer on other things um, throughout this process. So it's just really thinking about, I think in a very good way, where the priorities are and where are we gonna spend time and resources to help leverage the work that's already been done, but make sure that we can move the process along in such a way that our friends in CMS uh, realize that this is something that's the priority and we're willing to move forward with. Other questions? I can't see hands very well. Do you see? Over. Oh, Sheila has a question. I'm, I'm one of the practicing physicians in the area, and I feel that one of the main problems is the lifestyle. Like, the main problems are alcohol, substance abuse, smoking, gaining weight, obesity, uh, inactivity. So I think in the healthcare policy, there should be some kind of incentive for healthy lifestyle and disincentive for the unhealthy lifestyle. Some sort of incentive and disincentive. I think that would be a good idea. Thanks. You know, the, the federal government is, is very funny on what kinds of things you can do with respect to incentives. But you must have been a fly on the wall because I was having a conversation in the office today about what kinds of things can we do to incent the kind of behaviors that we know are going to lead to much better outcomes and lower costs. And you just nailed those are the kinds of issues that we have to grapple with. Um, but we walk a very fine line with the federal government around incentive programs and what kinds of things we can do. But we're going to work with the managed care entities, our physicians, our federally qualified health centers, our public health um, clinics, everyone who 
really is on the front line of meeting with individuals on much more of a regular basis to think about. To me, it's just a mindset around prevention and healthy lifestyles and, and those kinds of things. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, just in terms of changing the mindset around the services that we believe are critical and getting people out of the mindset of saying, let me just do X, Y, and Z. So we're going to have a lot of partners that work with us to pull together, I hope, a very robust plan around prevention and healthy lifestyles working in conjunction with our Department of Public Health, uh, which will be a great opportunity for collaboration. But those are the things that we certainly want to look to do. Okay. Other questions? I've got one here. First, thanks for coming to Carbondale. We're so happy that you're here and know that you're welcome to come back uh, frequently. We hope you do. Uh, I have a question just because I've gotten to know some of the folks from the Edgar administration who I regard with great esteem, so many of them, and you mentioned Mike Lawrence, but a whole lot of others, really great public servants. And I was wondering, what do you think drew all of you to that particular point in time and inspired you? Um, I, I, it all starts a lot of times with leadership. <laughs> and I will tell you that first year we were all together, it was a very, Dr. Baker was there too. It was a very difficult year. Um, but we all had this commitment to want to help the people in this state. And we rallied around um, the governor's vision for what he had um, with respect to um, what he was trying to do. And you're right, there were so many people in that administration, and I should say all of us who are still, I had dinner with Jim Walters the other night, I sent Mike a text, you know, I'm always trying to figure out when he's coming back, but um, we interestingly enough got together uh, as a group maybe about a month ago, uh, but there was a, I think there was a commitment to service, um, a spirit of collegiality and a belief that you had to work with all kinds of people to get the job done. So I, you know, I say every single day, one of the best things about coming back, uh, as people frequently would say, when you guys were there, you can work with you to get things done and we can trust what you told us. Um, that's incredibly refreshing to hear that, as you know, in an environment where very rarely <laughs> is that ever said. So in some respects, that's almost the hallmark of that administration. Uh, people knew that that was something that you can rely on. Um, and I think it really bode well for being able to get things done. And, and frankly, I have to tell you, it was almost a um, kind of a, a hearkening back to that time of saying that it's been done before. And I have to tell you, I was one of these people who would say, it's hard to get people to go into government. It's hard to get people to go into government. And finally, my husband said to me, honey, somebody's asking you to go back into government. <laughs> um, and I, I couldn't say anything other than the fact that that's true. So, I, you know, even though we are faced with incredibly, you know, big challenges, I have to tell you, when you walk the halls of the agency, and you talk to people who are so passionate about what they do and so committed to serve and to make things better. And when you realize that you really are the largest insurer in this state, it's a huge burden, but certainly a huge opportunity at the same time. So trying to be a part of a group of people, and I'm one of these firm believers in servant leadership, in terms of trying to work with people to get the job done, um, to me that's the, the challenge and how, you know, it seems daunting on most days of the week, uh, but when you work with people who you know are so committed to getting the work done, it certainly makes it uh, a place that you wake up very excited about being a part of. Well, we're running out of time, so I'll make my question the last one. There, there is in this room, and I like to ask this of our guests, there is in this room a future governor, senator, legislator, director. What should these students be doing today with their 
studies and their lives to prepare themselves for those careers. You know, I am a firm believer in internships, in volunteering, um, not just, you know, in government and other things, but I will tell you there are so many community-based agencies that are an integral part of what you're trying to do with respect to, you know, public policy in those areas. I was always one of these people that was a sponge. I mean, I'm in some respects, I'm kind of a public policy junkie. I mean, I kind of <clears throat> eat all of this up, but the reality is that there's so many opportunities to get involved, to really determine what you can do to learn about what's happening, if it's public policy, energy, you know, you name it. And there are a lot of internships in government that I can't say enough good things about. And I would say that people should take an opportunity to do one. You will learn so much. Now, the sausage making process is really ugly. <laughs> But at the end of the day, you have a very good perspective around how it all comes together um, in a way that you will never get from classroom experience. You won't. So I, I will say, you know, we talk about we have these gypsy programs, which are also internship programs and things of that sort. And the people in our office, we throw them right in the mix of everything that's going on. Now we give them the Vegas rules sometimes that what's, you know, is said in the room stays in the room. Um, but it's an excellent opportunity to get involved in what's going on. Dr. Jackson would be disappointed if I didn't use that for an opening to remind our students that we have an Alexander Lane internship, a Latino Heritage internship, the Gene Callahan internship, and about eight DeMuzio internships. So come see our office if, uh, if you want to follow the director's advice. And come to our office as a part of some of those internships. We want bright minds helping us think through these issues. So I will say come to help us at HFS. Well, Director Norwood has made the trek down here and has to go back to Springfield all in one day. <clears throat> and for those of us who've done that, we know it's tiring. So we appreciate your taking time out of your schedule to, to be with us today. It really does mean a lot. And thank you again for being here. And thank you all for being here. We're adjourned. <laughs>